You know, it's a sad fact that we just don't have all the time in the world to play every JRPG that releases. Simply put, some are going to fall in between the cracks and not get the proper time in the limelight that they may deserve. Due to this, some JRPGs get skipped over by a lot of people. And I don't think the games on this list are amazing or absolutely need to play games, except for the first entry on this list, but there are some fairly decent JRPGs out there that most people may have never even heard of. And there's a lot of JRPGs that fit into that particular category, but as always, this is my list of games. So don't get too antsy if your under the radar JRPG didn't make this list. With that, here are 5 JRPGs you may have skipped. And before I begin, don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it and subscribe if you're new to the channel. Legend of Heroes Trails of Cold Steel 1 and 2 Trails of Cold Steel 1 and 2 earns a spot on this list simply because of the fact that every time I upload a video and it has some Cold Steel gameplay in the beginning or end of the video, there is 5 or 10 people asking me what game is that. This is a crime that needs to be corrected. The Legend of Hero games are some of the best JRPGs out there that I feel not enough people know about and skip them as a result. This is a series that is big in world building and character development. The games are indeed text heavy, but there wasn't a time I was fatigued by it. In fact, I wanted to learn even more about the game's world and how every character or NPC reacted after each event. I mostly believe this is because of the excellent localization job XC has put together, and props to them for translating these behemoths side games. Most of the Legend of Heroes games connect and sometimes cross paths with each other from each game, so when I say this series is big in world building, you best believe it. The Cold Steel games also have excellent combat and voice acting. If you're looking for a JRPG that's going to make you do even more research into characters, the world, and how it all connects, the Legend of Heroes games are the JRPGs you are looking for. However, as of the time this video has been uploaded, there are a total of 4 Cold Steel games. The first two have been released in English, while the third and fourth games still reside in Japan. There's no telling when these games are going to get a localization announcement, but I'm telling you, it is inevitable. And these next games in the Cold Steel series look and play better than their predecessors. And then when the localization announcement does happen, you're going to be asking yourself, what game is this? Do I need to play the other games to understand the third and fourth titles? I'm helping you out with that right now. Play Trails of Cold Steel 1 and 2 while you have the chance. And you know, maybe play Trails in the Sky. You know, definitely play the Trails in the Sky games, that's probably a good idea. Final Fantasy Type-0 HD Originally called Final Fantasy Akito 13 when it was first announced, I was excited to play the game, but after the nuclear fallout from Final Fantasy 13, the name of the game was changed to Type-0. Sadly, we never got Type-0 on PSP in English after it was released in Japan. Fortunately, Square Enix would release an HD version of the game on PS4, and people outside of Japan finally got to enjoy this game. But not that many people in my eyes, even with the games released on PC. After the game initially released on PS4, people did like it, but it quickly faded from people's minds. In my opinion, Type-0 HD is probably amongst the top 10 JRPGs on PS4. You can control 14 characters and all of them have their own unique fighting style. The combat system also flowed pretty well and I enjoyed using all the characters. The problem with Type-0 though was the reliance on motion blur. For some reason, maybe to mask the fact that it was an HD remaster of a PSP game, Type-0 had extreme motion blur when it first released on PS4, to a point where honestly it hurt my eyes and I got sick if I played it too long. Thankfully we live in the day of patches and the motion blur was patched to make it much much more tolerable. The story, while good, can be extremely lacking if you don't know much about Final Fantasy XIII's lore, but it definitely was interesting to see the struggle of the young students of Class Zero in their involvement in a large-scale war. Now, I'm a pretty detached guy when it comes to sad moments in games, and I don't catch feelings when the majority of other people might when something tragic happens, but the ending to this game tugged at my heartstrings so much that I actually shed a tear. It was powerful to say the least. 
Arcrise Fantasia. Arcrise Fantasia is a JRPG that was released in 2010 only on the Wii. And it was kinda underwhelming to say the least, but I don't believe it was too bad of a game. About the only thing wrong with Arcrise Fantasia was the voice acting, which was, uh less than ideal. Unfortunately, there was no dual audio, something I believe this game desperately needed. Everything else was kinda average, but it did have a good active turn-based battle system that relied on a pool of AP points and stacking skills on top of others to create more powerful and useful skills mid-battle. It was fun and I honestly enjoyed playing it until the end, but the game didn't see much exposure. Releasing on the Wii didn't help that, and JRPGs, especially around 2010, wasn't as widely accepted as they are now. But I'm sure if Arcrise Fantasia got a support to the Switch, people would just eat it up, and it would probably sell double than what it did on the Wii. Summon Night 5 and 6. Okay, I'm kinda cheating by putting both these games on one entry on this list, but I've done it before in the past, so just let me slide with it on this one. Let's start with Summon Night 5. Most of the Summon Night games were not localized, so from a overseas perspective, it looks like they jumped straight to Summon Night 5. But not to worry, Summon Night 5 is standalone you don't need to play the other Summon Night games to understand this one. And Summon Night 5 is a pretty good tactical JRPG that was released on the PSP in 2016. That's right, a PSP game was released in English in 2016. Summon Night 5 had a very limited release, hence why some people really had no choice but to skip it. I enjoyed the game and really dug the character designs. Summer Night 6 released in 2017, and just like Summer Night 5, it had a very limited release. Also, being a tactical role playing game, Summer Night 6 was a joy for me to play. You had a wealth of characters to pick from and plenty of room to level up and choose whatever group of characters you wanted to use in battle. I felt the presentation was good in the tactical combat to be top notch. However, there was a glaring issue with Summer Night 6. For one, the voice acting is tolerable to put it nicely. Granted, some characters sound great while most of the cast does not. It seems it was too expensive for the localization team to keep their Japanese voices in the game, but you can at least turn down the voice value. Other issue with Summer Night 6 is its cast of characters. You see, while I said earlier there was a wealth of characters to pick from, the game's main story involves taking characters from previous Summer Night games, over 10 games by the way, and packs them into this game. So if you don't know those characters, the game's story isn't going to do much for you. It ultimately felt like this game was a final swan song to the Summer Night series and used the story as an excuse used to bring the characters together for one last hurrah. But just for the tactical gameplay alone, you can still enjoy Summer Night 6. I know I did and I played the game to the end. Black Rock Shooter The Game Black Rock Shooter The Game is an action JRPG released in 2013 and was released only digitally via the PlayStation Store on PSP and Vita. At the time, I honestly thought this game would never see a release outside of Japan. The game was based off a really popular Vocaloid character in Japan that really had no word of mouth in the West except for the incredibly small niche audience. Releasing a really niche JRPG in the West and having it for download only uh, I can't imagine this game did well from a sales standpoint, even at a $20 price tag, and even if we are going by the small numbers of the average in each game sales. I mean, you could argue that the people that were going to buy this game was a low set number anyway, but hey, as a result, I think a lot of people skipped it. This JRPG had a rather unique setup for its gameplay. During battle, you can aim and shoot with title character Black Rock Shooter herself while also evading enemy attacks and activating skills to aid you. It was a pretty decent action game and I did enjoy my time with it. Although I won't lie it was pretty repetitive. But Fortunately, the game was not long, clocking in at about 10 hours, so the game's repetitive nature wasn't that much of a hindrance. The game's definite highlight was the boss battles that had standout attacks and patterns that kept the ball rolling on the action. Make no mistake, the boss battles and Black Rock Shooter herself is what you came for and everything else, well, kinda falls by the wayside. But still a fairly decent game if you wanna just kill 10 hours.
And there's my list of JRPGs you may have skipped. Feel free to leave a comment on what JRPG you think didn't get a chance to shine. Let me know all about it. There are a great number of JRPGs out there, so I'm definitely interested in hearing your take. And you guys, as always, don't forget to like and subscribe if you want to see more. And I'll catch you guys in my next video that's more than likely about JRPGs. Because, you know, that's what my channel is all about. Long live the JRPG. Huh, I like that sign off. Long live the JRPG. Say I'm gonna copyright it.